In the late 1970s, the Boeing Corporation realized there was a gap in the market. They wanted to develop a medium-range, wide-body airliner that could serve high-density, short- and medium-haul routes. However, the task at hand was easier said than done. The 7X7 program, a development project focused on creating a new, efficient, medium-to-long-haul range airliner, was launched in 1978. Original mock-ups of the 7X7 included a tri-jet design to compete with the likes of the DC-10 or the L-1011. Other versions had a T-tail, since some engineers argued that T-tail designs reduced fuel burn. However, Boeing decided to pursue a twin-jet design, and thus came to fruition the modern 767 that we know today. The 757 was developed alongside the 767, and they both shared several design features, including similar fuselage cross-sections and cockpit layouts, meaning that pilots could be certified for both types if the airline they worked for flew both of them. This program as a whole aimed to deliver advanced technology, cost efficiency, and operational flexibility. One of the most significant innovations of the 767 was that it became the first wide-body jet to feature a glass cockpit, replacing traditional mechanical instruments with electronic displays. This offered better situational awareness and reduced pilot workload. Both aircraft incorporated advanced aerodynamics for greater fuel efficiency, with wing shapes optimized for their respective roles. The 757 had a more slender wing compared to the 767's wider, more powerful wings, which they were designed to support the increased capacity and range of the 767. Despite these differences in size and role, the shared elements between the two models allowed for operational efficiency and provided airlines with a range of options within Boeing's fleet of aircraft. Originally, the 767 was designed for a three-person crew, which was standard for large aircraft at the time. However, Boeing soon realized that that trend was shifting toward two-person cockpits, as airlines sought to reduce operational costs. In response to this demand, Boeing adapted the 767's design to accommodate just two pilots, making it one of the first wide-body jets to be certified for two-person operation. This change helped solidify the 767's position in the market as an aircraft that balanced advanced technology with operational efficiency. The 767 was, like the 757, built with versatility in mind. The ability to operate at smaller airports with shorter runways was not only limited to the 757 program, as the idea was incorporated into the 767 as well. Initial developments of the 767 didn't focus on the ability for transatlantic crossings, but this feature was something that would come into play later when the ETOPS regulations were further amended. The first 767 registered as N767BA took to the skies for the first time on September 26, 1981 and completed a seamless test flight without any complications or issues. After completing further tests, the 767-200 was certified for commercial use in July of 1982 and entered passenger service with United Airlines on September 8, 1982. In the early stages of its service, airlines used the 767-200 on domestic routes and shorter international flights where the aircraft's capabilities could be fully utilized, but within the constraints of the existing twin-engine regulations. The 767-200 was ideal for high-demand routes like New York to California or Chicago to Miami, where its fuel efficiency, wide-body design, and comfort provided significant operational advantages over older, less efficient aircraft like the DC-10. In 1984, Boeing introduced the 767-200ER, and shortly thereafter, the FAA introduced ETOPS 120, clearing the way for twin-engine overwater operations. The ER version of the 767-200 had a range of 4,600 nautical miles compared to that of the 767-200's 3,850 nautical miles. The ER featured increased fuel capacity, a refined wing to reduce fuel burn, and fine-tuned engines. TWA operated the first ETOPS 120 service with a 200 ER from Boston to Paris on February 1, 1985. In October of 1986, Boeing introduced the stretched 767-300, paving the way for the most popular variant, the 300ER, to take to the skies in 1988. Both models offered a 20% passenger capacity increase, and the 300ER's range exceeded that of 5,900 nautical miles, paving the way for transatlantic and transpacific services. 
The 763ER first entered service in 1988 with American Airlines and gained significant popularity after entering service. These early versions of the 767 series had two options for engines, the General Electric CF6 or Pratt & Whitney JT9D turbofans. The JT9Ds were eventually replaced by Pratt & Whitney 4000 series engines, and in 1990, the first 767 equipped with the Rolls-Royce RB211s was delivered to British Airways. However, the airline had to temporarily ground their fleet of 767s due to cracks found in engine pylons, and soon after, Boeing found the same issues leading to production changes and modifications to those engine pylons already in service. These cracks were due to the increased weight of the RB211s. During the late 80s and early 90s, the 767 was one of the most versatile and unique planes in the skies. Many carriers were using their 767s not only on domestic flights, but also international flights. The 767 was actually the most common plane to fly across the Atlantic at this time, and by the mid-90s, the 767 had crossed the Atlantic more than all other aircraft types combined. In early 1993, UPS placed an order for the 767-300F, a freighter version of the 767-300. This marked a significant change to the 767 program, and one that would keep it in production for many years to come. Included in the 76F was strengthened landing gear in order to support more weight, and yet again, an enhanced wing to reduce fuel burn. There were also several military variants of the 767 introduced at this time, including the E-767, a modified 767-200 sent to the Japanese Air Force fitted with a surveillance radar for self-defense. The KC-767, Japanese Air Force's 767 mid-air refueler, and of course, the KC-46 Pegasus, the U.S. Air Force's take on the 767 mid-air refueler. All these designs corroborated the fact that the 767 was insanely innovative and could serve varying purposes in the aviation industry. Also in 1993, Boeing began developing the 777, engaging interest for an even longer range, higher capacity twin jet airliner. As it settled on a design, the 777-200 proved to be just what they wanted. They had mulled over a shorter 777-100, but eventually decided to scrap the project and once again extend the 767. In 1995, the 767-400 was launched, but with little interest from airlines around the world. Delta and Continental were the only customers willing to buy the airplane. Delta used the 764 to replace its aging fleet of L-1011s, and Continental similarly directed it to replace their DC-10s. The aircraft had more capacity and range while simultaneously burning less fuel, making it attractive to both carriers. The 764 competed directly in the market with the Airbus A330, with the latter gaining most of the popularity. By the early 2000s, newer technology promised the future of the 767 would be uncertain. As the 767 production became increasingly inflated with freighters and military variants, Boeing began developing the passenger replacement of the 767. Later becoming known as the 787, the commencement of this program marked the end of passenger 767 production. The last passenger 767 was delivered to ANA in 2011, but interest in freighters remained high. In 2007, DHL and UPS combined to place 33 orders for the 76F. In 2011, FedEx ordered 27 76Fs to replace their DC-10s. In 2015, they also placed an order for 50 more 767s and added an additional four in 2018. Because of the freighters and military equipment, the 767 is still in development today, and as of writing, is expected to be produced until at least 2028. In 2019, Boeing flirted with the idea of re-engining the 767 as it would be a cheaper alternative for an all-new mid-ranged airliner. However, plans for this project have been shelved for now, but let me know what you think in the comments below. Should the 767 program be reignited instead of Boeing developing a new airliner? Also, don't forget to tell me your favorite memories on board a 767. Don't forget to check out my recent trip report on board a Delta Airlines 767 that I took in November. I really hope you enjoyed this episode of A Brief History, and I appreciate the continued support during this series. Don't forget to leave a like, subscribe, and I'll see you next time on A Brief History.